Well, again, it is um, a huge privilege to have been here and to have uh, fallen in love with all of you <laughs> and been on this journey together. Um, the two scriptures I wanted to um, bring up, and then I want to show you how Glenn Clark both came and left um, CFOs so that we can not only leave right but come right to the next one. Um, because this, this is about training. This is a spiritual training ground. And there's, unfortunately, no off-season <laughs> in the sports, following the sports analogy, right? You know, there's, there's a season for football, right? But not in this one. Satan doesn't take a break. Um, so we need to keep training. The first one is my dad's t-shirt. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you as well as the rest of it. Um, and that's from the Sermon on the Mount Christ is talking about. I think it's, I didn't look up the reference because dad was wearing his shirt. So I was like, well, that's convenient. Um, but basically that is our mission statement. That is God's mission statement for people. That's what we're called to do. And we're called to do that here. We've been doing it here. We've been in this place where we are apart and where we are all working together to help each other do it as best we can, to learn how the Holy Spirit speaks so that when we're home, we can hear him better. So that when we're home, if we, you know, something happens and we need a way to get it out, now we know some ways to express it out. We can just grab a piece of paper and say, Lord, how... What do you want? What are you saying in this? Speak to me. I know you speak to me. We've heard him here. Um, so that's one. And the other, um, the reference is escaping me. I didn't look them up because I've, I've got them in my, they're written on my heart, but I, not with references at the end of them. Um, but the verses uh, do not conform any longer. Yeah, any, any, uh, I was going to guess Romans, actually. It might be eight. It's New Testament, you're right. Um, I'm, I'm thinking it's Romans eight. Do, yeah, do not conform anymore to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renew. Oh, it's Romans 12. Yeah. Um, it was eight or 12. I knew it was one of those. Um, so, do not conform. Don't, you are going back to the world, but don't go back to the way you were. Um, we've had workouts. When you have workouts, when you bench press, and you've, you know, we've, maybe we started at 100 pounds, and through the course of the week, now we're at 150. You don't go back home and just start with 100 pounds, or you don't put the weight down at all. That would be like, well, we did all those fun things at camp, but I'm not going to do any of them anymore because that was just fun and just for camp. It's not for camp. Um, but the most important thing we've been doing here is loving one another and listening to God, listening to the Holy Spirit, letting the Holy Spirit fill us and come out, learning to have that flow in the way you go about your day. So if you're getting filled up and you never are giving out, if you have no part where you're serving others, where you're giving in your life, that's not good. You need some place where God can use you, where God can work through you um, to give. Um, so those were the two verses. And um, so the Holy Spirit goes with us, and our sword goes with us. I have a sword now. Counselor and gave it to me. Did you get one? Oh, so it's just me. It's my sword. I feel so special. Um, and they, the, I had not prepped them on the fact that I'm a warrior or anything like that. And my letter opener was breaking. So it's very practical and it's cool on many levels. But this is a sword. Yeah. I, don't <laughs> I, will, it, I, I checked everything except for um, my laptop. So I'm, I'll be, I should be fine. Um, but the, 
you know, one of the things that, that happens at CFO is we get set free. We, we lay down burdens. We, we um, strongholds are broken. All these things happen. And Satan's favorite trick is to lie to you and tell you it didn't happen. And if he can convince you that it didn't happen, he can put it back on you. So we need to have our sword ready when he comes with those lies and cut off his head. Every single time he comes at you, you know that part in um, Braveheart where he cuts off the guy's head? I know it's really gory, but that's what we need to do to Satan. Like, it's not like poking him or punching him. It's, oh, it's over. <laughs> like, done. Um, so use your sword. Um, our enemy is not a friend. That's the word of God, yes. Um, I'm very not militaristic, so I, I only like killing Satan. Um, <laughs> When Jesus says, love your enemies, I don't think that means bomb them. Um, so that's an aside. That's a freebie. Um, <laughs> so here's how Glenn, I want to read. It's a pretty long chunk. Um, so, wait, is that it? Yes, okay. All right. Um, Okay, so Glenn founded CFO in 1930. What happened in 1930? A little U.S. history lesson. The Great Depression had just started. 1929, Black, what was it, Friday? Tuesday? I thought it was Tuesday. Um, um, <laughs> so, so the economy was in shambles. And Glenn was a man of prayer. So, and CFO is actually birthed in that, um, that context. And I think that is very important for understanding what seeking the kingdom looks like in our world today, how we go from here. So let me, I'm just going to read, it's like six pages, but the font's pretty big. So, um, and I might stop now and then. When the Great Depression of 1929 burst upon this country, 50,000 people out of a population of 450,000 people in the city of Minneapolis were thrown out of employment. By the end of the second winter, the surplus funds of the city were exhausted. The community chest was empty. People who had given to the breaking point would not be able to give as generously another year. Little nest eggs saved up for a rainy day had vanished. Insurance policies kept up until now for borrowing purposes had lapsed. Little mortgages now grown to great ones were wiping away houses and lands. The whole city had been bled white by two exhausting winters of depression, would not be able to meet the situation ahead unless some new solution presented itself. Now was the time of all times, as far as Minneapolis was concerned, for someone to catch a vision of God. CFO is about catching a vision. So I decided that the time had come for someone to make use of the great discovery that I have just described. You'll have to read the book to figure it out. But First of all, or he says, number one is we lift up our eyes. First of all, I went into my closet and lifted up my eyes to the great God who has never failed his children in carrying into fulfillment every promise he ever made when they truly call upon him in perfect humility and perfect trust. For days I gave this need prayerfully to God. I knew that somewhere, somehow, there must be a method for taking care of the unemployed in this great city, if God would just open our eyes to it. After many weeks, light began to come. So he, hasn't even, he doesn't have any idea about CFO starting then. This is 1929. But... He came, or, you know, how we should come to CFO is, I'd sum it as prayed up. <laughs> like, prayer is not something we do here. Prayer is something we breathe <laughs> daily. Um, we should be communing with the Father and finding out what he wants us to do. But the biggest task of all 
was looking the problem itself straight in the face from all the angles of north and south and east and west. And this part of the process, let me remark, me remark is where something besides cloistered prayer is necessary. So this is something of cloistered prayer, what we've been doing. Most cloisters, I don't think they do devotion in motion. But this is something like that. We've been away. We've been apart. And Glenn knew that it wasn't about that. He had to get out. He had to go. Here is where the prayer process must put on overalls and plow and dig and delve. Here is the point where Edison's definition of genius, which is nothing but prayer in action, is right. Inspiration is 99% perspiration. That was Edison's quote. I dug, I delved, I perspired. I studied into the statistics available for the unemployed in Minneapolis. I asked people who ought to know what was the likelihood of the city governments being able to meet the situation in the coming winter or of the charity organization's ability to meet it. I'd sum that up as, like, education's important. When God gives you a call, um, you know, I went to Cornell to study up to figure out how in the world am I supposed to, like, bring the kingdom of God to the Bronx. I need to know how it works. Um, yes, the Holy Spirit is our teacher, but you should probably read a book, too. <laughs> like, you should, you know, that, that shows caring that, that um, you want to know what others have found out. We don't need to reinvent the wheel is sort of, sort of the point, that there is information out there that can help us on this journey figuring out what the call is, how to go back. Then I began an investigation of methods being used in other cities, the trade and barter schemes that seemed feasible, the script model, or the script method, etc. Finally, I prepared a more or less definite, or definite but tentative plan that seemed to contain the germ of the solution, provided it had the right man to head it, and the support and cooperation of the city government, and the prayers and moral support of the churches and religious people behind it. I even picked the actual man who would be competent to head this whole project. I had a half-day conference with him, and he promised to be on hand at the meeting in the mayor's office. But I am a get I'm getting ahead of my story. I was now ready for the hazardous step of sharing this dream with others and getting them to agree, envisioning it together. Uh, visioning it together with me. I began this gradually with one or two kindred souls, and then when I had safely weathered this exposure without damaging explosions or leakages or cold blanketing, I presented it to the entire board of spiritual directors. After they had agreed together that the plan was a good one, I acted upon their urging, and together we met with the mayor of Minneapolis and his secretary one Sunday afternoon to look the whole matter over together. When the Sunday afternoon arrived, all things went as expected except one, the man we had selected as the one most capable of heading the project did not appear. We accepted that as God's way of telling us in his gentle manner that he was not the man God had chosen for the task. Therefore, we trusted that he must be choosing another, another with exactly the same amount of executive and organizing genius as the one who failed to come. The mayor, although a praying man, was not accustomed to seeing dreams presented so candidly in his office nor was he accustomed to meeting people who believed that dreams come true. While he could offer no help, he offered no obstructions, and the meeting finally ended with a fine spirit of fraternal cooperation. The project up to this time, you will realize, had been limited entirely to the realm of the unseen. It was not even visible as yet to the outer eye. Not even a leader had come into view, much less the workers. All was in the realm of amorphous half-light. It was a mere looking to God from the place where we stood, a mere looking northward and southward and eastward and westward, a mere agreeing together of two or three. We had reached the stage where the next step in the divine unfoldment was to take the whole dream, the whole prayer, the whole plan, whatever you wish to call it, out into the garden of God and plant it. Yes, plant it and go off and forget it. It so happened that a number of us had gone to a camp which we called the camp farthest out, a retreat for experiencing the wholeness of the spiritual life. This camp was to last for three weeks. There, this, this is what they did at that camp. We took up the project of organizing the unemployed as the chief topic of an entire morning's discussion 
And with uplifted eyes together, we saw God's workmanship in this plan. And great was the sense of peace and power that came to us in the final hour, which was an hour of prayer and silence, when we planted our dream in the heart of God. Social policy is not to be organized in a government building in a sterile environment with a bunch of academics. It's a creative. <laughs> That's what I think. <laughs> I think God has much better ideas for social policy than those guys. They're not praying. They're not listening to the one who knows the problems and knows the heart. And as I've, the more and more I deal with people, I know that I do not have enough knowledge to just figure out what they need. I just don't. So, that was the before, well, he kind of sticks that in the middle there, but that was part of getting the vision for a social policy for the unemployed. I don't remember a creative on that yet, but I think that's where CFOs needs, I mean, in many ways, Glenn was way ahead of his time. We haven't even caught up with him, I think. <laughs> we need to get there. The next week, we began to read in the Minneapolis Journal of a perfect replica of our vision for the handling of the unemployed for the coming winter. But it was in the words and functioning of another man, a man we had not thought of in this connection at all, but a man who in character and capacity was an, as ideally fitted for organizing and carrying on such an endeavor as the one we had originally considered to head up the project. Moreover, this, may not only, this man not only had the character and the capacity, but he was fired with the vision. I think we have a lot of leaders who just want the power but don't have the vision. Um, you may recall how the disciples tried to select a successor to Judas in order to give God a part in the selection. They sifted the candidates down to two, and then drew lots, trusting God would preside over the drawing. In short, they did the nominating and let God do the electing. They forgot that God likes to do the nominating as well as the electing. <laughs> Glenn cracks me up here. Had they lifted their eyes and looked north and south and east and west, they would have seen God choosing Saul of Tarsus, not by lot, but by lightning. <laughs> During all the time we had been looking at the problem, northward, southward, eastward, and westward, God had been selecting the man to direct our vision. So that is another thing about CFO. We are about kingdom building here, but there are lots of other people who are CFOers, but they call it something else. <laughs> there are Christians that have the kingdom vision, that love Jesus like we do, that know the Holy Spirit like we do, that have dreams and visions like we do. And we need to find them and build it together. Um, and not be like, oh, they weren't at camp. I can't talk about CFO stuff with them. Oh, this is God's kingdom. He uses anything. <laughs> Donkeys. Um, okay. Um... He had sent this man across the continent on a passionate errand, getting data on how other cities were trying to solve their unemployment problem. He was returning from this trip asking himself over and over again, who is the man who should do this thing for Minneapolis? While we were praying for God to send us the right leader, he was crossing the state of Wisconsin when suddenly a question hit him squarely between the eyes. Why don't you do it? <laughs> and I think that's very true, that where a lot of times we see something, we see a need, we see something to do, and we're like, I wonder who should do it. <laughs> and we need to listen long enough to make sure that it's not us. It might be you. So upon his return, he immediately set about it, and everything fell into his hands as though it had been prepared ahead of time for him, as it actually had been. Glenn had been praying for this. Um... And there's the leader, there's the plan. God's big. He works things out in amazing ways. What followed, I hardly dare to put into print for the general reader, for it would test the credulity of anyone. Even before this man knew of our interest in his project, he drew leaders from our group. 
He established a partnership of prayer with us, and we saw our mutual dream come into fulfillment in a marvelous way before our very eyes. I haven't time or space here to enumerate the great quantity and variety of service the Organized Unemployed Incorporated of Minneapolis rendered to the 30,000 unemployed who registered in it. Thousands were helped in legal service. Thousands more were saved from mortgage foreclosures, and still more thousands were aided in medical and first aid service. 20,000 articles of clothing were renovated the first year and made over as good as new. 12,000 pairs of shoes were remodeled. 33,000 yards of new cloth were made into clothes. 600,000 meals were served for scrip. Labor and material were traded for 156,000 bushels of farm produce from 218 farms. 8,500 cords of wood were cut in 37 wood camps. Farm products going to waste on farms for want of market were traded for the labor of harvesting them. These articles were canned and bottled and served the hungry tables of thousands of unemployed in Minneapolis during the winter months. Thousands were given regular employment, thousands more part-time employment in the whole city and surrounding country felt allevi alleviation of the unbearable strain of want and misery which had been settling like a pall upon the city. Before the first year was over, the success of the movement became known all over the world. And thousands of people seeking the solution to their own local problems came to study its workings as pilgrims journey to a shrine. Over 205,000 mainline telephone calls and several thousand general inquiries by mail came in from all over the United States and Canada and Europe. A week did not pass that did not see delegations from all over the country, even from, even from Canada and England, visiting the plant. Newspapers and magazines everywhere told the story of this Minneapolis movement, including a bunch of ones that, well, I'll just read them. Literary Digest, Good Housekeeping, The Farmer's Wife, New Outlook, Christian Advocate, Jewish Forward, Zion's Herald, Broadcaster, Commercial West, and Commonweal. Oh, New York Times, and Christian Science Monitor, too. Hundreds of other newspapers, in addition to thousands of syndicated articles through the Associated Press and the United Press, which carried long articles about it. We can sum up the above by saying that this project, which began as a dream no larger than a mustard seed, became a towering tree, and the birds from near and far came to rest in its branches. Here then was convincing proof that when two or three vision a project together in the spirit of love and harmony, even when their visions do not agree in all details, the fulfillment of their collective prayer is better than any of the individual visions. And that leads us to a very significant and far-reaching truth. If God can take our little visions, which two or three give to him in the spirit of harmony and love, and bring fulfillment greater than any of us alone can dream, why cannot we use the same method in giving God our larger visions for the solutions of our national and world problems, in the same spirit and with the same faith, trusting him to create out of the very imperfections in our visions, the great perfection of his larger plan. If you do not believe this, you should lay this book aside at this point and go no further. <laughs> but if you do believe it, turn to the next chapter and read it through carefully from beginning to end. Just where does your vision and viewpoint agree and merge with the rest of ours in this great orchestra of love? So the world's out there. We've been training. You're on the right team. That's good news. <laughs> we win in the end. Um, but it's going to be a fight. It's going to be a, a long game. But now we have a river of life flowing out of us. And everyone is screaming, scrounging, scraping for that life. When Glenn got it, when they did, they heard one thing and hell. I mean, they did a lot. That was a lot, and a lot of people were involved in that. Um, but everybody is looking for the kingdom. Everybody is looking for it. And Jesus is in us. The Holy Spirit is in us. 
and he goes with us. So we can tap into what he wants us to do. And if we do those little steps, um, and don't get discouraged. You know, Glenn could have been like, ah, the leader didn't show up. <laughs> what are we going to do? He's like, okay, God, how's this going to work? <laughs> that was my idea. What was yours? <laughs> he always used to say, none of my prayers are answered. All of God's are. <laughs> so if I can pray with what God is praying, I get answered prayer. <laughs> like, so um, I hope you have caught a vision this week. If you haven't, um, keep seeking it. The Holy Spirit, um, you know, Glenn, had, Glenn showed up with that vision, and they prayed through it. And they gave it to God. That's what they did at CFO, was they showed up with a vision. But this is also a place to get the next vision, to do what's next. Because the kingdom keeps advancing. You don't just need one vision. You need a vision, and then you need to do the steps until that vision happens, and then you get the next one. And keep going. So, um, I pray that the seeds... Um, that God has planted in us would be protected. Um, that he would send his angels to surround them and to, um, that he would renew our minds every day, that we would be filling them with the word so that we have our sword ready when those lies come. Um, and you are all in my hearts. This is two or three gathered together, which has been reprinted by McAllister Park in this fine volume. Ooh. Whew. For a, the low, low price of, I don't know, something low. <laughs> is it right inside the cover? No, I don't think so. But he wrote it in 1953. It, it's, it's not that expensive. Well worth it. Um... <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, 12, something like that, um, which once you get to college, you will know that $12 is an amazing price for a book. <laughs> You'll pay $100 for a, a soft cover that you don't even read. Oh, college. They're high-priced textbooks. Okay, let me pray for us. Um, Father, we want to see your kingdom come. And it is amazing to think of how many churches, how many um, kingdom groups that are represented in this room, how many people that our lives touch. We pray that the seeds that you have sown into us this week would um, be protected. We just um, pray that, that your angels would go with us and surround us and that we would keep marching on, that we would keep doing our workouts, reading your scriptures, praying, um, going through these, these kind of spiritual training exercises that we do here so that we can stay spiritually fit and ready to serve when you call us. Thank you for this precious time that we have had. Um, and thank you that, that uh, you go with us, that you are all we need. In Jesus' name, amen.